Hello, and welcome to Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter, noted comic book anthropologist, and myself, Hannibal Taboo, the head comics reviewer at Bleeding Cool. We're here on Clubhouse and on YouTube, pretty much on a weekly basis, discussing output of books that came out in the world this week for retail sale. Comic books. That's what we do. That's how it works. Stanford, how are we doing this week? Ah, we are, we're holding up. It is, it is mere days before Halloween. Things are already getting a little creepy. Are they getting spooky, mysterious, and ooky, though? That's always why I look out for them. Well, you know, judging by, judging, judging by the books we had this week, it, some people are trying. <laughs> I think that's a great segue. Let's jump on into those books, Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the king of keeping the show moving along. Thank you for joining us, Jake. This is Comic Books This Week here on uh, the It's Complicated Club. Please join the club to let us inform you when new things are going on. What book are we starting to review this week, Stanford? Let's start Let's start in the DCU. Okay. Um, let's start with Robin number seven. Robin number Oh, I know why you picked this book. Because you love Connor Hawk. And Connor Hawk <laughs> is in this book. So you had to talk about this book first. I know you now, Stanford. Well, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> What do we think about Robin number seven? Well, you know, I feel like I feel like 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 I'm starting to like Damien at least within this that you know this story arc. Welcome to the but club. This, but this story arc is this, and and I like this. I kind of like the story arc. I just feel like it's going a bit long. Well, we are talking about a fighting tournament on a, a secret island, a la Game of Death. That we're now on issue seven, and this is only the second <laughs> issue of actual fighting. So, exactly. Yeah, that does seem a little belabored. Perhaps I'll agree to that. You know, but but I th- I feel like the um I feel like the characterization of Damian Wayne really does carry carry this book. I mean, it carries this book way beyond it. It, it carries this book way beyond way beyond what the plot does because yes. not much has happened. That's true. Yeah, Damian's. If I didn't enjoy Damien's snarkiness and his sarcasm and his relentless determination and focus on his own skills, then yeah, I would have tuned out of this a long time ago. I totally agree. Yeah, and and quite frankly, I thought I would be coming for Connor, but Connor is they haven't been doing much with this character. They had that one that one heart to hawk between Damien and Connor where they compared what, what it was like being the son of and mm-hmm. That was a really interesting couple of pages, but since then it's just, ooh, Connor Hark's gonna kick your ass. Okay, and then he does the ass kicking off panel. I knew you were gonna comment. I was literally just, I was like, he's gonna be mad at this. The one Connor Hawk <laughs> moment to shine, he does it off panel. I knew you were gonna be upset about that. Am I wrong though? You're not. You're not at all wrong. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to feel my pain on that one. I, I, well, in that I don't care, I don't feel it, but I respect it. If that's good enough, I hope that helps. If that I helps. guess it's the most I'll ever get from you, huh? <laughs> I mean, you know, pain. I don't so much share it as distribute it, but that's just my, <laughs> that's just my professional, you know, uh, goal in life. So, in any case, yeah, for me, of our ratings that go from buy to honorable mention to meh to no, I would call this one a meh because I'm like, oh, we're still doing the same thing, and it's still going nowhere in this plot. And, oh, that's boring. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So we can agree on that. Let's 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 see where we are on Aquaman, Green Arrow, Deep Target. Okay. This this this. I was I was because what I thought this book was, it wasn't. And when I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never seen that done before. Go that way. Sure. Let's throw a little Lindsay Lohan on it. I don't mind. But it didn't give me enough plot or enough of an understanding of what's going on, especially in terms of whatever the antagonist is to cause this uh, fishy flashpoint idea that we're doing here. Um, And that was a concern for me. So I was, I didn't feel like I got enough meat on the bones of this story. Yeah. I, I, I completely, I completely feel you on that. Um, I felt like, I felt like, like it was something I never asked for and I'm still not sure I want it. Um, and I, I, and, and I'm a Green Arrow lover, and I've, I've very much come around to being interested in Hawkman, or not Hawkman, uh, in, interested in, uh, Aquaman of late. Fish, not fly. Uh, Fish, not fly. Yes. <laughs> Flashbacks to a couple weeks past. Um, but no, I, I, 
I, I, I like the twist of like I like the twist of them switching things up, but but yeah, I'm still I'm still wondering why you gave this to me, and and even now that I've got it, why I'm here. Um, I'll give it a. a I'll, I don't want to say that this is bad because not enough has happened for it to be bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, I give it a, I, I give it a high meh. Yeah. I would, that's literally my exact uh, rating. And I think I've got an idea of what's happening here because the DC office has been pushing. This is now the third or fourth Aquaman book out. Um, and most of them, I'm going to, I'm going to just point it out, are written by black writers. So, you know, Brandon Thomas on the uh, Aquaman the Becoming, Brandon Thomas on this, Chuck Brown on uh, Black Manta. I think this may be, you know, the new door, way in the door for black writers who, you know, are looking for a series. So on that side, I'm like, yay. But Aquaman still smells like fish sticks. And I'm still not really getting a sense of what is happening in the story. What I'm getting is strong characterization. They're working right. very hard on the characterization and fleshing out the differences between an um, Oliver Queen, who's the king of Atlantis, and a uh, Arthur Curry, who's the world's greatest archer. So I appreciate the work that they're doing there, but that's not necessarily all the meat I need in a story. Well, and and you know what this story actually did for me, and, and I know this is going to come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. is it really solidified... Um, solidified the, the, for me my feelings about about Green Arrow in the comics and Arrow on the screen. Clarify. Um, it just it, it it actually really put those in contrast. For, and I don't know why this one did it, but it made me realize that like, like, like just the things that work with with the Green Arrow in the comics versus what worked what works in the WB right. Mm -hmm. Where the Green Arrow in the WB he did not work well once he start once you introduce powers right. He was very much a vigilante. And this thing is all about powers, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if Oliver Queen gets powers? And this worked, right? This mm -hmm. worked a lot better than, than than what we saw what we saw in the Arrowverse. But I still like my Arrowverse arrow a little bit better. Hmm. That's interesting you mentioned that because I really thought it was funny the time that he was training Barry and that like he was using arrows and beat Barry. <laughs> handily without even without even really working very hard in a way that you know because people on the set of Arrow and yes we're digressing a little bit or whatever they would even call the show Bat Arrow because they wanted to do Batman but they couldn't do Batman so they just put right. all of the Batman tropes and gave him a bow and arrow uh, right. and a different supporting cast so I was like yeah okay sure if that's what you want to do but I was really Cinematically, it took me two seasons to get past the idea that this wasn't a wisecracking, super hard left liberal uh, uh, um, Green Arrow, and that was hard for me to get my brain around for two seasons. Right, and the thing is, I I, I prefer wisecracking and super liberal, but I still preferred the guy who wasn't. Yeah, I respect it. I respect it. You know, but I, I, I you know, I'm going to say this, in you know, in defense, in defense of the television writers and the whole thing about like. You know, you know, Barry being defeated with some arrows. He's being defeated with some arrows while he was in training. So he wasn't skilled at using his powers. He was he wasn't ready. That was proof. The fact that he was losing to some arrows, that was just proof that he wasn't ready for prime time. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree at all. Yeah. So we gave that a high med. This is Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo, here on Clubhouse and YouTube. We have discussed uh, Aquaman Green Arrow Deep Target number one and what was the other book we discussed? Oh, Robin number seven. Wow, I'm already right. forgetting it. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. What's next, Stanford? Um, Aquaman The Becoming. Not the Begoing, but the Becoming. Okay. But it should be going. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's <laughs> talk to me now. What do we? What do we say? I mean, the first issue came out the blocks, and I was like, "Oh, wow, this is interesting." Yeah. Great characterization with his mother. Oh, look, that guy he's interested in. Oh, we're getting some hints at some other weird stuff going on, and everything kind of blows up. This one, it just kind of, it just kind of meandered, right? Yes. You know, this whole thing with Mira being woken up by some guards. You're trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, I thought there were some interesting, some interesting things that did happen. I'm, I'm intrigued more and more to see um, what's happening with the Bell, with, with the Bell people and, um, and, and how that ties together. Hmm. 
uh, Aquaman's mom and Mira. I like the, I like the, I like what they're doing with the whole extended family situation of of Jackson being a part of being being like you know being a part of Mira's family. Like like Aqua Aquaman, you know, Arthur and Mira are kind of you know they're kind of like the uncle and aunt, right? Yeah. Um, and he's really invested in the, He's really invested in his in 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 his his little stepsister, right? I mean, it's it's great. I love I and I love when they touch on that, right? Mm-hmm. But they didn't have much working around it on this one, and I really, I really felt like, like, like last one was just like boom, 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 boom. Everything was on point. Yep. And this one, I, I just, I felt like, I felt like they stepped back from the quality they got me used to. I don't disagree with that. Uh, I don't know if I'd be as hard. What, what I noticed here. I really appreciated the wake up thing as a narrative device. The way that they worked that around, the, the the tricks that they did with it in terms of playing with the timeline. That was very television. I appreciated that from a craft standpoint, but from a storytelling standpoint, it didn't tell me anything. It didn't tell me anything that I didn't already know. It didn't take the characters anywhere they weren't already there. And right. that was, as you say, a little bit of a letdown given the the, the breadth of, of wonder that was presented in the first issue. So. I don't know. I, I think I think second issues are hard. I mean, in the same way that second albums are hard, in the same way the second lots of things are hard. Uh, it's in taking the foot off the accelerator pedal uh, to allow you know this this elaborate kind of you know Rashomon gag with the timeline here. I think that took away from where we could be developing the plot, where we could be like pushing things forward and making things happen. Right. I, I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, um, I, I, I have to give this one a high meh. You know, I mean, I, I, right I, 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 I still want to, I still want to keep going. Um, I still want to, um, um, I, I still want, I, I still want to encourage people if they like, if they like Aquaman to, to, to keep following the story because it didn't drop off so much. So I'm like, don't follow the book, but True. I just can't, I can't say that this. If I have to look at just this book in this week, I, I, I can't say enthusiastically this is this is what you got to be dropping your dollars on. I totally agree. I always look at only this week and only this book, and we are three for three agreeing on comic books this week. This is Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo. What is next? Um, let's see. Um, I heard that you read. I heard. That, I heard that you read Deathstroke and Quote. Incorporated number two. I want to hear what you think of that. I did. Deathstroke Incorporated number two was they decided to go full out action movie. Like if you put the Expendables in a comic book, it would be a lot like this. It was just go go go, shoot shoot shoot, blow things up, blow things up, uh, fight 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 nonstop. Uh, there was an attempt at a little clever twist at the end of it, um, but the thing that didn't sell for me was that every character was essentially a stereotype. Um, Black Canary was the, oh, God, I can't believe I'm stuck in this thing. Fight, fight, fight. Deathstroke's like the, as long as I get paid, slice, slice, slice. And uh, Toy Man in the armor that Jim Gordon wore as Batman, which is super weird, um, is the, hi, I'm the fresh-faced person loving to go do stuff. (laughs) And, (laughs) and of course, then there's the untrustworthy uh, handler that's, like, telling them only the information they need to know not what they absolutely have to know, and things like that. So, I mean, it played heavily with tropes. Now, did it play heavily with tropes well? Yes, absolutely. This was an excellent excellent application of craft in using cliches that doesn't make them not cliches. And for me, I'm... I mean, don't get me wrong. If, you, if you're good with cliches, go with it. But for me, I'm looking for a little more depth. I'm looking for a little more of the why. I'm looking for a little more, as I keep saying, meat on the bones of the characters here. The plot was like nonstop. Go, 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 plot, plot, plot. But that doesn't necessarily make you care about what's happening. Okay. So, so you want more depth out of Deathstroke? I want more. Yeah. I want more, uh, if not more depth, definitely more depth. Mm-hmm. You want more what? If not more depth. Then definitely more depth. I'm doing a play on words there. It'll, it'll, we'll fix it in post. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what was your take on DC versus vampires? Okay, Stanford, you know, the second I see vampires, my brain starts to turn off. You know that. And <laughs> my brain You know, my take to... on vampires is not, nah. Yeah, yeah. So after 
Marvel Zombies, after Deceased, after it's like, oh, we're going to throw them at this completely ridiculous otherworldly thing for a few issues for fun. Yeah, okay, if that's the money grab that you want to do, feel free. This was not a story that compelled me. This was not a story that gave me anything from the characters or the plot that uh, I felt resonated. There's no emotional truth. I mean, even in Deceased, there were some great, great emotional truths. Moments of connection between Damian Wayne and Jonathan Kent. There was a lot of really amazing development things there. But, yeah, this this didn't, this was very cursory, very surface level. Yeah, I mean, ah, <laughs> you're not going to see me defend vampires, so... <laughs> <laughs> Over so what what say what say we what say we scooch on over scooch on over to Marvel unless there's there's something else in DC you want to cover right quick. Uh what well, okay. Really quick, I'm just gonna talk about Batman Fortnite Foundation, which I know. Fortnite, that sounds ridiculous. But in this book, they essentially established that Fortnite, and, and this is not necessarily a spoiler, because it's more something that like you should have gotten in the game, but you don't, because I played Fortnite for a while. Um Fortnite is the connective tissue between fictional universes the same way that St. Elsewhere was the connective tissue between fictional universes on television. That now that Batman and Deathstroke and Catwoman have been there and Star Wars has had a whole scene from their whole Skywalker saga play out there and the Avengers have fought Thanos in there that Fortnite said, and I quote, "Um, the Zero Point created not just universes but each one with its own multiverse. The idea that Fortnite is at the root of fictional creations in general, and theoretically, because they love licensing and because they love money, allows them the room to bring in anybody from anywhere, and it automatically makes sense. And that, okay. that's clever. That's really kind of a clever trick to you know squeeze the most possible money out of something. I really appreciate that. From a story standpoint, eh, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's done well. Batman bats well. Um, for some reason, there's Luthor and an army of supervillains trying to get into this rift, and then they just kind of give up when it doesn't happen. Whatever. That was kind of a waste of time. But uh, the focus on Batman and this Foundation character was actually kind of interesting from a very meta standpoint, uh, right. if you're into that. Uh, you know, if, if you're watching, say, for instance, Legion or Doom Patrol or you know, things like that, you'll suddenly hook into this meta side of it and say, oh, that might be a thing. But, you know, otherwise, you could kind of pass it by. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, on to Marvel. Yes, sir. All right. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't talked about him in quite some time. How about Amazing Spider-Man number 77? Well, first of all, Amazing Spider-Man is not Peter Parker. Let's start there. So, you know. Second of all, Amazing P- Spider-Man is a clone of Peter Parker. So, automatically the sad trombone comes out. And third, it's Ben Riley. Now, the last time we saw Ben Riley, he was the Scarlet Spider, and he was schmucking around Las Vegas, trying to be kind of a, a mercenary and, and general enforcer for the casinos or whatever. Apparently, that fell through, and now he's got a new girlfriend, and he's doing stuff uh, with uh, he's doing stuff with you know what's called the Beyond Corporation. I think we've seen them in Spider-Man before, and all these things just are kind of. We're going to side horn in a new Spider-Man on you and you're going to like it. And I'm like, am I though? Uh, Because while he's got more of a movie logical suit, he doesn't have any more interesting character elements to him. He's essentially a bootleg Peter Parker. And I mean, you know, if, well, let me put this way. If you had to drive somewhere and they gave you the keys to... if he's a bootleg Peter Parker, that's just truth in advertising. Because isn't a clone just a bootleg person anyway? Well, in well, uh, I mean, at the, in the Clone Wars, we found out no. But um, here's the thing: if somebody, if you had to go somewhere and somebody gave you the keys to a Yugo, you would get where you're going, but you wouldn't necessarily be very excited about it. Ben, hmm. he's kind of the Yugo of Spider Man. <laughs> Quote that one on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Well, I I gotta admit I I, I kind of agree with you. I did think it was, but I did. But here's the thing: I thought it was nice to see. Well, I thought it was interesting to see Spider Man. Of course, he's got he he the spider. You know, the the Peter Parker clone has a you know a a shadow of Mary Jane, right? Okay. In terms of his girlfriend, 
Um, yeah. I did think there was some interesting characterization there of like what it what you know, and her her describing what it's like to kind of you know describing living there being a gilded cage that kind of stuff. I thought that was interesting, but the thing that was really off putting for me about all of this was seeing um, Misty Knight and Colleen Wing and having them like. Like, just in there to be, like, shills for the Beyond Corporation. Weird. Super weird. That didn't work for me at all. I'm like, when did you demote yourself to to henchwoman? Hey, you know, people got to pay them bills, you know? That mechanical arm needs oil. I'm just saying. Yeah, but we're talking about, like, hench hench salary levels. That's not real salary. But there's benefits. I'm like, you know... (laughs) Dental, dental being a being, being out of your costume, you need dental benefits real bad. Well, you, I mean, I, I guess so, but hey, I, I just, I'm like, I just, I, I needed more explanation as to why they were there. It just seemed really like, I felt, I, I felt like at best they were slumming it. At, you know what I mean? At worst, they were demoting themselves. I do not. And I, and I, I did, and I did not need to see. I did not need to see that at all. I mean, I thought that I thought that the little like glimpse into what's happening, you know, in the exciting world of Peter Parker, um, not much happening there. But you know, so people exciting. are sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it it is what it is. Um, but you know, it was. I gotta say, it was it was not the worst thing in the world. I mean, one thing I did like was I I did like the art and st- the art as far as the st- you know the art and storytelling. Oh, yeah, I thought that pretty. was. I thought that was pretty. I felt like um, I, I didn't. I didn't mind being in that world. I That's mean, right. I, and, and and so I have to. I have to say that, and and that does count for something, right? It does. Um, it does. But I'm. I, you know, th- this is this, this is like I, I'm not going to say bye unless you're unless you're a fan. Absolutely, yeah. Amazing Spider-Man this week did not really connect the way I really wanted to. Um, but yeah, just. Uh, this is Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo. And I'm sorry, I just have to stop and give a shout out to Stephanie Williams, who just stepped in the room, the writer of Nubia and the Amazons. The history, I'm sorry, the history making writer of Nubia and the a- Amazons. And, and just wanted to give a shout out because we respect you and we love the work you're doing, sis. And thanks, th- thanks for chiming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Back to what we're supposed to be doing, because I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to get distracted. But you know, black, you know, it's like, hey, let me shout out to Cousin Ray Ray over there. Cousin Ray Ray, we see you, right? You know, that's the way you got to do things. But <laughs> what's the next book we're going to do, Stanford? <laughs> well, let's, I have well, a cousin let's go from, Ray Ray. I have a cousin let's Ray go Ray. from Spider-Man to Black Widow. Okay. Black Widow is depressed. Uh, black Widow was brainwashed and kidnapped and given a perfect life with a husband that she adored and a genetically uh, created son that was exactly from her and from this new husband and she was so happy but of course it was an evil plan and the evil plan blew up and she had to send them away so people wouldn't kill them to torture her and she's sad and she wants to be with them and she misses them but she knows if she does they'll be horribly maimed so she's sad and she's running like a like I guess like a spy camp or something in San Francisco where she's got Yelena, the other the white widow, I guess we're calling her and uh, one of the spider girls, Anya Corazon, I believe and somebody else knew who's gotten powers. And they're just kind of, you know, training and doing super stuff in San Francisco but, you know, then uh, kind of like Silver Surfer used to go oh, Shalabal, oh, wah, wah, wah now uh, Natasha's like, oh, my husband and kid, wah, wah, wah Now, don't get me wrong, I get the idea of missing your family, and I totally don't want to minimize the importance of that. But it's not a bit that's resolving. You know, it's not a bit that's going anywhere from a narrative standpoint. I didn't feel like it was meant to go anywhere. I felt it was just, it was just just there as kind of a, as kind of a plot hinge, right? Um, You know, to, to explain her mood and to kind of establish the, you know, this new status quo for her. Um, I, I have to say one thing. I mean, even more so than the than the Spider Man book, I enjoyed being in this world. I felt like good. the art was the art was impeccable. I felt like like the storytelling was impeccable. I felt like it. I felt like unlike many of the comics coming out, is that it wasn't overwritten. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt like I, I felt like like I felt like everything everything just flowed. 
Um, and, and yeah, and I, and I felt like I was, you know, I felt like it was in a, I was in a James Bond movie. I mean, it was like, like they kind of, you know, they, they basically got all these characters that work well in that, in that kind of spy genre mm-hmm. and for them to, and, and, you know, they're basically trying to sneak into the, sneak into the bad guy's lair. I mean, I, I, I think that they did so much right in this issue. I, I have not been following, uh, Black Widow regularly, but. You know, I, I have to I have to recommend that people buy this. Hmm. You know, okay. um, it's it, it's not something. This is not something I thought I'd be saying, but you know, I, I sat through the book and 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 I I didn't want to leave. Interesting. Okay. Well, you're you're definitely feeling it a little more than myself. I uh, would call this a high mat. It is indeed it is indeed well crafted. It is indeed well done in a lot of ways. But for me, the central struggle and the idea of the fight is not connecting. Um, I'm not connecting to what's happening specifically. And the new person with powers is so peripheral that I really don't even have a grasp on what she does or how she does it. And I'm, I've been reading every issue of this series. Uh, so that's a little hard for me to like come in a month later and be like, what do you do again? What's your gag? What's your deal? And not remember. So. Mm, I, I, I see, I I see where you're coming from on that. I, I, I'm still going to push people. I'm, I'm still pushing for a buy on this one. Um, so, so let's let's skip around. What what about what about um about Star Wars Vader? Oh, okay. I'm a soft target. It should be easy to sell me a Star Wars comic because I love Star Wars. I love Vader, and I'm very simple. And this book was like, okay, all the things you want here, have all of those things. Vader with ill quotes. Vader doing something really dope with his powers. Uh. Uh, imperial scheming, uh, uh, drama in the galaxy, all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, a, a really, really clever last page <laughs> that I was like, oh no, I didn't see that coming at all. Oh, that's crafty. I love that. And the elevation of a character from one of uh, the latter day movies that really did not get the chance to shine into a real thing. And doing it in a way that will make sense that this character did all these things outside the movies and you know, you don't see their effect there, but their effect is still happening. That's really hard to do. That's a number of really difficult plates to spin at the same time. And this book nails it. It nails all those things at the same time. Because when Vader walked in the door, he's like, but the question you should be asking is, what of Lord Vader? I was like, oh, snap. You just going to roll up on him like that? <laughs> Vader was like, he was he was in his bag for this whole issue, and I was like, I'm here, I'm here to see Vader in his bag, even as he bends the knee to the Emperor, or even as he tries to choke out somebody else, and just like, there's just so much great stuff I really enjoy. And you talk about wanting to live in this book, the visuals, the visual presentation on this book is breathtaking. It's so good because it's so cinematic, it's so cinematic accurate without being obvious you know kind of what they call greg landish photo reference where you're right. actually actually able to enjoy the artist's interpretation of the ideas and not just the ideas themselves so i really enjoyed a lot of great things that happened with star wars darth vader number 17 and since since we're in in the star wars world what about star wars war of the bounty hunters <sighs> this less so because this was an ig88 issue right where ig88 uh is put back together and then IG, well, okay, here's the thing. If IG-88 were your friend, you would not have a friend. I'm going to put it that way. Um, and watching IG-88 kind of have this poor form behavior while not really learning things, you really expect for a machine to learn things when it does stuff. But nope, I'm going to just blunder through, shoot, 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 oh, fail again, oh, well. Shoot, 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 oh, well, fail again. Wait a minute, why am I, I'm supposed to be dope. Why don't I, why do I keep failing? Let me try. Shoot, 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 fail again. I'm like, seriously? Seriously? <laughs> Machine intelligence is supposed to be better than that. I'm, and if IG-88 was Skynet, I would have a lot less to worry about. So that one, uh, it, <laughs> wow, that was kind of rough, wasn't it? Uh, that was <laughs> Even I stopped like, oh, Hannibal, why did you say that? Why did you do that, baby? Um, yeah, this would be a meh for me uh, because I appreciate Star Wars. And again, it looks good, but this one didn't have all the same balanced elements in it. Hmm. Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes you miss. <laughs> That's true. And IG-88 does that a lot. 
Oh. This is Comic Books This Week with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo, on Clubhouse and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we're going to move through some more Marvel books, and then before we get into some indies, what is next, Stanford? Um, what about Sword? Oh, Sword. You like Sword a lot, and I kind of like Sword, so this was a bit of a mixed bag issue for me. Um, when I looked at Sword, I saw, you know, there's a uh, the, there's a lot of good plot elements that happen here in this assassination attempt and visiting nobles and the politics and the uh, the fact that Canada is apparently now super racist uh, because uh, the Guardian James McDonald Hudson has decided to sign on with Orcus, the most racist anti mutant organization around. And literally, like you look at them, and 99% of them are white. So it's like, come on, man, you really. You really didn't want to try to diversify your racism a little bit? You didn't? That okay. was, and that was a head-scratcher. I mean, I, I have to say, th this whole issue was a head-scratcher for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have never seen so many things that I like put into an issue, and I didn't hate it, but I didn't like it. You know? It was just like, it, 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 I felt like it, it was like, it's, it's like, it's like, have you ever played Dirty Hearts and someone's, and someone's going for a Boston and they miss it by one card? That's what I felt like. That was one of the blackest sentences ever said on Clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I'm like, dang, that, I feel my blood pressure just went up listening to that sentence. But that's how I felt. Like, like, okay. We both love the Legion of Superheroes, right? We do. We do. Come on. We, let's get we, into we, this. Love, we love the Legion. And, um, and I love and, the Fatal Five. And I love the Fatal Five, too. And, and you know what? I, I, I also love the Imperial Guard. Even the though the Imperial Guard is, yeah, the Boot Legion, mm. um, and it's booty. I, yes, I see. Yeah, that. <laughs> I love the I love the Boot Legion, um, but damn, they did they did the Boot Legion wrong. They did the Boot Legion wrong in this one. Um, they did the Fatal Five wrong. Yeah. Well, I thought I I thought that was kind of funny, and I and I saw some humor in it, but then I was like, Ugh. like. Like one of the things, one of the things that gets me about that's interesting about the Legion, right, is that you know you got superheroes that you know characters that represent planets, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 what I don't like is when they bring in the Imperial Guard, and that's not just in this issue, but I've seen it done in other issues, where they bring in and they take that element and say, oh. Since it's somebody who just since it's someone who represents the planet, there's a replacement out there, so we can use these, so we can use these as like super powered cannon fodder. Yep. And I, I, I just don't have a. I, that takes to me. It's like, it's like I, I don't care that you kill the char kill the characters I like. What I care is when you don't respect them. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> and That's this fair. was just like I was like, I was like, damn, you don't. And and I knew it was going there the moment the, the moment they bring in their their version of Timberwolf, which is kind of a, also a knockoff of Wolverine, and he starts sniffing everybody. I mean, come on. Yeah, for me, I mean, because uh, uh, Jeff Thorne always says the original beats the uh, knockoff in every case, and for this to be the bootleg Legion, the thing that they didn't take from the Legion was the optimism. The, exactly. The Shi'ar Imperial Guard are militarized servants of uh, a regime, a, a power structure. They don't care necessarily that much about their job unless they're zealots like Gladiator. And to see them, you know, they're joyless and they're just kind of go at stuff or whatever. The only one, that, the Colossal Boy knockoff, who I don't think they even named, the Colossal Boy knockoff was the only one who had kind of some fun with it, and he died so quickly. I was like, that's embarrassing. That's really sad yeah. that you didn't even think to look at that. You know, come on. Um, there were a lot of elements here that the derivative nature of it took me out of my enjoyment of it. Because to see somebody who's literally wearing Colossal Boy's costume and literally using Colossal Boy's powers and is not Colossal Boy, and I'm like... This is, this is, it's jarring. At least, you know, if you're going to copy off somebody else's paper, at least change it up a little more. Making the Fatal Five disposable mercenaries in the same way, they're like, oh, we'll kill them and we'll make another one because they're robots or something. I, I, I agree with you, Stanford. I don't believe they respected the concept of this. And in disrespecting the concept, they didn't get why the concept was interesting in the first place. Yeah, and, and you know, and you know how I always say that, that, that to me a story is a promise. The mm -hmm. thing is, the thing is, is, if if you 
if you can't respect the characters in the story, you're really not respecting the reader. True. Oh, you know what? That's real talk. You got that. I like yeah, that. and and that's where and that that's where I was like, okay, this is just like, like. You know, I mean, and, and 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 that's also one of the essential elements elements of, of of a comic, right? It's it it's it is like laced with nostalgia. It's laced with 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 characters that you root for, that you're fans of, right? Yes. So when you when 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 you disrespect the characters, like like I I don't have a problem with my characters being made fun of. I don't care if they're dragged. I don't care if they're killed. Well, I do care if they're killed, but <laughs> but you know, but but I'll, I'll say this about the Legion. One of my favorite stories was when they killed Karate Kid. One of my favorite characters. Oh man, that was right? so deep. Oh man. Exactly. Right? But they respected the character. They respected the character on his way in. They respected him while he was here and they respected him on his way out. He went this out like was a just sheep. like Yeah, this was just like, okay. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. Um I I so that was an issue for me, but it was also but it wasn't just that. It's like it's like even the way they got rid of forearm, I thought that was kind of like just just wrong. Yeah, ew, yeah, right? that's, that's not kosher. That's you know. I mean, for that that one was a little bit less because you know forearm will be back next week because Krakoans don't die. But right. for the Imperial Guard, they're like, "Yo, we're supposed to take this seriously, but we're really not, so we're just gonna die." Yeah, and you know, and the, the whole thing with with the the quick flash over the storm, still mm-hmm. fighting, still fighting in the Circle Perilous. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think I think that's interesting. This idea that she that she's just always going to be fighting because there's always going to be a challenger, which just tells me how much they hate her, right? Um, I think you know, they just like um, fighting. They don't care about who she is at all. Yeah, but but I got the sense that that that, that other characters had some time to rule when they weren't fighting, <laughs> yeah. so there seems to be a pretty long line for Storm. You know, I. I, I I'm, I kind of appreciate that they gave us that little flash as to what was going on with her, but I really wanted more. Yeah. I really wanted more, and it's not—it's not something where I have this like this like long-standing love for Storm, and I got to see her in every page. But there's something about that that plot point that they were making that that just screamed for a little more exposition, a little more storytelling. That's all. They are nailing one good thing with Storm, where when she walks in the room, she makes an entrance and she makes an impact. She's yes. killing it with quotables. She's taking on the voice of soul, or in this case, as some people are joking, the queen of soul, S-O-L, uh, in a very serious way. And I appreciate that approach because it puts more seriousness on her than we got in, say, oh, I don't know, the Mohawk period or whatever. Um, so I appreciate that, that level of respect, but it's a thankless, horrible job that sucks and has very, very few benefits. So... You know, I get that they want to make her a queen on the same level of Black Panther and all that. And I, I get the reasons behind it. But when I look at a character, I'm like, when you wake up in the morning, what makes you get up and do the thing that you're going to do? Right. And for Storm, I don't know what that answer is. I don't know. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'm going to say I felt the same way about, um, about Cable in this book, right? Yeah. Where I need a little more. I, I just need a little more because, okay, he was kid cable. Now he's grown folk cable. And, um, you know, and I get that's one of the problems with, with the sprawling X universe. You know, yep. they say that you don't need to read every book, but you kind of need to read every book because then a character shows up and you can't make sense of them. Um, you know, I'll I, explain I, it to you, but you're not going to like it. Okay. What, what happened? <laughs> so kid cable was doing something. Well, kid cable killed old man cable. Because, yeah, uh-huh. you can start snoring. Totally. <laughs> Kid Cable killed Old Man Cable because he was trying to f- change the future and fix things. But then right. he got in too deep and realized, oh, shoot, I don't know what to do. So he found a version of Old Man Cable, snuck him out of the timeline. Oh, wait, no, they resurrected Old Man Cable in the uh, Krakoa thing. That's what happened. And then he took over as the present day Cable while Kid Cable went to the future to go do something else. Oh, okay. All right. And... I told you you weren't going to like it. And 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 Daddy's fine with that. Daddy Cyclops is fine with that. Okay. Any, um, all cables are about the same to him. <laughs> it's not like satellite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is just yeah. I I I, I really I, I yeah yeah I yeah. I, anyway. I I have to give I have to give sort of math. I would give it an honorable, partially because just because I appreciated the plot construction, 
but it cannot go. It's a low honorable because of the enormously derivative elements here. Right. This is this is this this was uninteresting to me. Yeah, um, I, I felt that. like I, I felt like I made it through this book on memories of when it was of when it was better, <laughs> um, and that's not good. Yeah, because um, that last page reveal, I was like, really? That's stupid. Why would you do that? Yeah. Um, so well, you know, speaking of of convoluted X Men stories, um, okay. Inferno number two. <laughs> Jonathan Hickman's swan song as he exits this mess that he left. Yes. Um, Moira McTaggart and Destiny are essentially at a kind of war with each other. Now, that war, of course, endangers the lives of, oh, I don't know, every mutant alive. Um, or to be born if the resurrection cue is to be believed. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Destiny's back. She's making moves. She's taking stuff on. You know, she's like... She, she, she's walking into the room and just basically saying, all of you belong to me and, and you can't say anything about it and you're going to get over it. And that was weird to watch. But for all the sturm and drang and whatever, it's all just talk, 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 talk. That doesn't change anything for Krakoa, that doesn't mean anything. And then more importantly, here's the part that as a black person, really, you know, as I've seen in my community, empowers the enemies of the people who are against them. Right. And that just was like, come on, y'all. You, you got a whole island and a planet and, and financial security and come on now. But it's hard to escape the, the training that your brain is given and in the world it's made to destroy you. I get that. Well, I mean, I also feel like this is like, this is truly like, like I, I just was reading this and I'm kind of like thinking to myself, do better, guys. Just do better. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, what one thing that is interesting is they managed to they did they did really make Mystique feel like feel almost heroic, right? You know, she's bringing she's bringing back her lover. She's she you know I she's on I a could mission. I could feel for Mystique, right? Yeah. And every time I saw Magneto, Xavier, and MacTaggart together, I'm like, oh look, that's the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. <laughs> You're not wrong. I mean that's not unfair. I mean the professor Hickman's Professor Xavier is I mean th there's nothing admirable there admirable there for me. I mean I feel like he is he is like like he's found some way to strip him of his good qualities. Um you know he's made Magneto a much more interesting character. Like 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 if I'm going to choose someone to lead Krakoa, I'm like Mags come here. Mags you know. <laughs> I, well, you know, Hickman has made me root for a war criminal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, Hickman's, Hickman's Xavier is a direct descendant of Morrison's Xavier, who uh, was very calculating, very cold, very messed up, and was not the, you know, I'm living the dream Chuck Xavier that we were used to in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and there's a certain pragmatism to that, and there's a certain amount of results that you can say, well, okay, that adds up. That seems to have worked better for you. But it does, you know, it, 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 takes the, it takes the heroism from it and makes it more of a militarized pragmatist thing, which, honestly, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say, I'm a little surprised to see certain people glomming onto, because if it were coming from different parties, they'd be like, oh, how dare you? So... Well, and that's my point. Like, like I actually see somebody who is more, who is much more admirable in in Magneto. Like, like even like the way he makes his decisions, where it's like, you know what, um, I, 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 I can't do this. I can't do this. The, the old me would have done this because it was expedient. But the, but, but this person, this me that I am now. Now that I've been given this Krakoan second chance, I, I have to fight for something bigger than myself. Holy crap! Someone actually talked about something bigger than themselves. Yeah. That is something, and that's been lacking in this entire run, right? Yeah. Is this idea that there's something bigger than themselves. I mean, this has just been, I mean, this has just turned into, into factionalism. I thought yeah. that, I thought that, I did think that the vote was interesting to see, to, you know, to, to see who voted. To um, you know, you know, to, just to see who voted what, right? Like to see 
Nightcrawler support his mother, right? Mm-hmm. I thought that was I thought that was an interesting moment, right? Given how little she's given him. Exactly, exactly. Um, but I also feel like one of the problems with with Infer- with Inferno, since it's shining, shining light on Mystique, is don't show, don't just show me about her trying to get back Destiny, but show me her relationship with her son. Yeah, who could be Destiny's stepchild? Exactly. <laughs> 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 I'm very proud of that one. That one made me very happy. I'm very, very happy with myself. Right you know, and but but wouldn't it have been really interesting to have to have Nightcrawler in on this whole thing of like, like, like I could I could see Nightcrawler being like, you know, since nobody's saying why it is that they're not bringing Destiny back, mm-hmm. I could see Nightcrawler being all up in Xavier's face for why aren't you bringing Destiny back, right? And moreover, given what he was doing in Way of X, you'd think those two story tales would storylines would almost dovetail into each other. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but but yeah, I feel like there was a missed opportunity there. Still, you know, I, I'm gonna say as far as as like reading experiences, I I didn't mind being in this world. I didn't feel like I was being disrespected, like in Sword. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so yeah, I mean it. But there's just the problems with this book are like the inherent problems that have been that that, that Hickman has kind of dragged through. Yep. Right. In that, like, in that he created one thing he did do was he created some really interesting ideas for like what was going to happen to mutants, right? Yeah. But what he didn't, what he failed to do, and and I and I'll take this, take this, I'll take this through all the books, right? Is he has is is he has tried to? Is he's made the characters fit the plot more so than allowed the characters to deal with the plot? Oh, Tom King, right? yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's like it's like it, it's like this would be a more interesting story if he had let Xavier be the optimist. Hmm. This would have been a more interesting. Imagine Xavier being the optimist and being held back by more McTa- by uh, Moira McTaggart. That does sound more interesting, yeah. right? And 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 create a situation where Magneto is and and it's it's in many ways it seems out of character for him. But imagine Magneto as the man caught in the middle between these two. That's an interesting. That's a more interesting dynamic. Let's get you into editorial. This is Comic Books you know. this week with Doctor Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo. We have about fourteen. I'm sorry, thirteen minutes left. Um, we I, I'm I'm gonna give Inferno a meh because. I, while I didn't mind being in this world, I just you know wasn't very interested. I'd rather go down to the bar for karaoke night. Um, uh, I'll give it a, a high meh because it is someone's swan song, and I want to give him a chance. Oh, I love that sweetness in you. I don't believe in it, but I love it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, is is there any other Marvel that any other Marvel stuff that we want to do, or do we want to jump over to Indy real quick? Let's get Indy. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, um, I, I okay. Oh, I did. I, I, I demand an apology because apparently Image sent out time before time as review copies a week before it came out. So I actually wasn't supposed to read it. You were actually time traveling, reading it in advance. I am therefore uh, 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 redeemed, or vol- uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm now innocent of whatever you said of me. So you just outed my powers. Well, you won't use them to get you lottery just, numbers? Yeah, you, I will do that. You, mm-hmm. you, you just outed my superpowers. I, I thought that there was something sacred on this show. <laughs> if you thought there was something sacred on this show, you're on the wrong platform, pal. We're going to YouTube and Clubhouse. What are you even talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't, we get, why don't we get your review of Time Before Time? Okay. Time Before Time uh, is a, self, it, it's a button episode. It it's, closes it in and on itself. And it was really nice the way these three groups intersected and came together over uh, the mechanics of the book, which is time travel, relocation in different times. Um, but, you know, struggling and need and people needing to get themselves together and, and just the desperation to escape whatever horrible things are happening in 2140 and beyond in this future. Um, that's all very fascinating to me. And the storyline is tied together really well. The co-creator, Declan Shalvey, actually stepped in as an artist because we know him mostly as an artist. And he, he applied his style to this, which is less stylized and, and more kind of gritty. And I think that really made this much more of a noirish read that I really enjoyed 
impossible people faced with impossible situations. So, yeah, I, I really liked Time Before Time quite a bit. And I know from the future or the past, depending on where you're standing, that you did as well. Well, yeah. <laughs> time Before Time is consistently consistently a good book. And, um, and who resisted that book? And who, who pushed them to read it? Which way did that go? I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, moving on. So... <laughs> Let's okay. So I it, there are two books where I went back and read read just multiple issues um, because I just wanted to sit down and and just kind of marinate with the plot a little bit. And and so one of them was Black Beacon. We we talked about yeah. Black Beacon number two a couple weeks ago. Did deep um, dive? What do you got? And, yeah, and Black Beacon number three came out. Um, and I went back and read Black Black Beacon number one. So like I've I've, I've, I've I read them all. Yes. Um, and um, it's better. I think that this is definitely a book that needs to. I, I think that this is this is not a good monthly book. This is a book that needs to be a that needs to be a graphic novel. Okay, I I know what that's like. It it's it's just it's really hard. I, I and I realized it especially after reading them all together how hard it is to figure, to to carry over stuff because. Because like like some of the main plot points are just like barely mentioned, right? Mm. Um, you know, like like the whole thing, like 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 with them. That sounds bad. You know, the, I, well, no, no, the idea that 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 this character is just sent to this place because of a beacon, right? And he's there to check it out for humanity. That's kind of cool, right? But it's just it, it it it's like there's very it just starts though with her arriving. So we don't even have a sense of what Earth looked like before or anything like that. So I was just like, I was like, oh, okay. It's it's actually pretty cool. It's an interesting story, but it's like, but it's like, but it's like once I started putting them together, I, I, I definitely had more appreciation for the story. But I think this should definitely be a graphic novel. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the economics of things push people to make them as single comics, whereas graphic novels are really the format for many of the stories that they're telling, uh, right. and that's an unfortunate reality in terms of what's going on in this regard. So, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, what else we got? Because uh, uh, you, are you, oh, well, let me correct that. What is your rating on Black Beacon? Yeah, you know, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it, um, I'm going to give it a high meh. Okay, that's fair. Then what'll be next? I, I, high meh, low honorable mention, but, you know. That's your kindness it, leaking it, through. I hear it. Y yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I bleed kindness. <laughs> um, well, here, here, let's do, um, let's do Mother of Madness. Mother of Madness is interesting. Lots of wacky things happen there. She, it's a character who her hormones give her different, men, uh, and different parts of her hormonal cycle give her different superpowers she's you know turns to goo when she's happy she you know gets super strength when she's on a period she turns invisible at one point and you know so on and so forth so and here she's forced to fight at the lowest part of her powers against a very kind of stepford wives sort of vibe and this this issue was very heavy with politics but i think it was also you know it had enjoyable action elements it had you know great turns of phrase but I don't know if this is something that every reader could latch on to uh, I believe it's something every reader would benefit from reading I absolutely believe it would help every reader but I don't know if that would make them reach, reach for it like a vaccine right. <laughs> too soon? no it's not too soon I, but I think that actually, I feel like that is a good analogy for this right? everybody needs it but a lot of people aren't going to get it yeah yeah, <laughs> you know, Toxic I mean, masculinity it, goes into its variants. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I had a little bit of trouble following this, but that's because I came really late to the party on it. Yep. Um, I but I still found it really interesting. I I I but I all you know, there's that, and you know, I can also feel the the greenness of the writer in this. Huh. Inter well, yeah. yeah, I mean, Amelia Clark, who played uh, Khaleesi on Game of Thrones, is newish, but she had some help here that was not like, you know, not like exactly a new booty in the comic, you know, domain, so. 
Yeah, but there are a couple like like there are a couple of pages that were just like one was just well, there's one one splash plate that was just word salad. Yes. Um, okay, that's fair. That's fair. You know, it, it's just little things like that. Like like I I I, I feel like like this could have actually been a much better it, it was a good book right it could have been a much better book with a with 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 a little more um structured editorial touch to it hmm. and and that's because because i just think that that there are some rough edges to the writing that 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 someone need to be able to go in and smooth out a little bit okay. I, i'm still gonna i still recommend the book i'm not saying i don't recommend the book i recommend this book but I feel like I, I just felt like like there are these it it didn't have um, it it lacked consistency in terms of the in terms of the flow of the reading. Yes, there were a lot of rough points in it, and and the, the pacing is uneven in some ways. Uh, and I don't know how much that is, you know, Marguerite Bennett cleaning it up or Amelia Clark slowing it down. I'm not really sure. Um, I appreciate the idea of this book in ways that the execution of this book may not allow me to. Okay, and so so be more specific. Well, okay. So, for example, um, the big fight scene where uh, there's a ch change for the antagonist. I'm not going to spoil it, but I'll just say that much. Um, this is supposed to be a climactic moment that instead devolved into what I thought the third act of the first Wonder Woman movie was, and truthfully, kind of the third act of the second Wonder Woman movie. Just kind of a, a mess of storm and, and yelling and, and, and smashing of things, you know, in the way that people accuse Marvel uh, uh, third acts of being. But those, those have emotional resonance. I didn't, I, I get the, the idea of why I'm supposed to hate this uh, antagonist character is based in, again, cliches. Um, the real motivations behind it, the real, what makes somebody like this, oh, you know, just mustache twirling villain sort of stuff. Not to, you know, masculinize it, but that that was what I got from this villain, and that's not, it didn't feel very strong uh, in that right. way. So, yeah, I, 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 and again, I don't know where that came from in the process, but there's a, a lot of solid ideas here that I think if you adapt this for film or something, immediately the filmmakers will be like, oh, we need to streamline this and do this this way and this way and this way, you know, and it'll come out right. exactly right in the same way lots of things in Marvel did that way. That's true. That's true. So, so, uh, so I say, I'd say you're a buy on this? I'd say I'm an honorable mention on this because the craft okay. is not standing up. Uh, and, but like I said, you know, there's... There's no time I would say that this was a bad book. There's no time I would say you don't you you wouldn't benefit from getting this stuff in your head. But right. yeah, it's it's not necessarily something everybody's going to reach for. I, I agree. Honorable mention. Um, so um, I went back and read um, read all four issues of Dark Blood. Okay, what'd you think? Well, I thought the the first issue, the second, every my my one critique of the book. I feel like there, I feel like the idea for it is really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, black guy returning from the war. It looks like he's being experimented on the down low, and then there's this variance thing that's going to give him abilities, right? Okay. Um, I feel like the first issue started went from one, one to eight. I feel like the second issue turned around and went back to one and then just took it from one to 8.5 okay and the third issue went back to two and then took it to 1.875 or took it to 8.75 okay are you seeing where i'm going with this are they playing it's with just, your emotions you're saying it's a roller coaster no no i feel like I, I i i feel like i'm reading the same story over and over again with each issue oh oh i don't like that I don't like that. Yeah, you know, because it's a flashback and it's basically the same type of flashback and it and and like in terms of the progress, there's maybe there, there's not a lot of progress in terms of the endpoints of each issue. Hmm. Like we still haven't really gotten to a real exploration of, of this person's powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're four issues in. That's my that's my critique of the book. I feel like but I feel like there's a lot of other things that are really interesting. I feel like the mood is interesting. I'm, you know, the writing is really growing on me in terms of the interactions and, in, you know, in, the, in these small southern rural towns. Yep. Um, all of that's there, but, 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 you know, I, when I went back to it, I thought to myself, what it would be like to read all these together like it was a graphic novel? 
And that and that really made the whole issue of each issue is basically it's basically it, it's an echo. So it's a detriment and, to read them together. Yes. Oh, okay. Huh. Um. So I I I have to I I, I regretfully have to give it give it I, I can give it a high mess. Okay. You know what? We have to do what we have to do. So that's real talk. All right, um, we are creeping up on the hour, but I've got a little time to wiggle because my wife is doing someone's hair. Um, okay. <laughs> is there uh, anything else we want to discuss here? Nita Hodge Nightmare Blog. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Nita Hodge Nightmare Blog. I don't even know what that means. What is that? <laughs> That's the name of the book. <laughs> I don't remember seeing that at all. Okay, what, what is that? What? what? You, don't re- you don't remember seeing it? Is this, are you time traveling again? Nita, okay, Nita Hawes's in small letters and Nightmare Blog. I literally have by no image. idea what you're talking about. It's by Image. Rodney Barnes, Jason Alexander, Patrick Reynolds. Ah, uh, let me go look here. Nita. Oh, I see it here. Oh, 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 yeah. That's, that cover frightened me. I didn't open this. <laughs> yeah, I took one look at that cover. Said, nope, nope, not today, Satan. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, my brain literally blocked out the memory of this, and I had no idea what you were talking about. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I I gotta say, I I like it. I I love the I I love the the the, the scratchy, moody, darky art. It's just you know what I mean. It's got you know you know what I mean. How like how you got art where it's just where it's kind of scratchy. It's very moody. Lots of like lots of dark spaces in there. It's. This is this is the art that you want to see in a good horror comic. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I don't like horror. That's why. I, <laughs> you remember I had a hard time getting into the me you love in the dark. <laughs> oh come on! I mean, okay, they have the scene where the guy's eyeballs get ripped out. And, oh yeah, yeah. I'm just flipping yeah. through this like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I'm gonna protect my peace. Nope. Well, I. I'm, I'm just gonna say this. It's 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 kind of a straight up. Um, it's it's almost Night Stalker it Night Stalker esque. Um, the lead character Nita Hawes. Mm-hmm. She is um, she's a college professor. She teaches on the paranormal. So um, she's like a female version of you. It, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and she's in Baltimore. You know, I have a history there. Um, I gotta say, I loved it. And one thing I did love is the way they, it, did, it wasn't just Baltimore, right? Yeah. She, she teaches at Morgan State, which is not in, which is not like, like in Baltimore proper, like the downtown, but it's, it's off on the edge. It's an HBCU. Right. Um, um, it's, it's the way they, I mean, they, they really did make efforts to bring Baltimore alive. You know, um, like they have, you know, Cherry Hill, which is in Baltimore, right? Yeah. Um, her, her talking about about Philadelphia is Philadelphia. Yes. Yeah, right. Mean, I mean, all, also it's, written it's, by Rodney Barnes. I see what they did. Ex- exactly. Exactly. But all of these little, there's just all these little things where it's like, I'm like, yeah, I kind of felt like I was, I, yeah. Hang on I, a I second. I felt like I was in Baltimore. Philadelphia is also an image book by Rodney Barnes. Is this in continuity? I don't know. Huh. It wouldn't surprise me. Because you know I love continuity. You know I love Yep. <laughs> I, I love continuity more than I hate whatever just frightened me in those pages. Well, you know, so so you got that and, and the thing is she's haunted by the by the ghost of her murdered um brother. Mm. So like she's in so like he shows up and he's he's helping her through all this stuff. Oh that's <laughs> it's, cool. It's a, it's it's great and but it's got a, it, it, it has a very grim Baltimore feel, and I, I appreciate a book that can actually make a place a character within it. Agreed. Okay, well. And I I'll particularly appreciate it when it does it, and that character is not Los Angeles or New York City. As somebody working hard to write a book about Memphis, I totally understand what you're talking about. That's Project yeah. Wildfire in stores 1124. Nice. <laughs> You know, uh, I else, mean, are, are, are you are you gonna? Quick question: Are you gonna since it takes place in Memphis? Are you gonna do anything special in Memphis to celebrate your book? Uh, there will be uh, exclude. Well, 
With the pandemic and our families having vulnerable populations around us, it's difficult to go in person with people. Um, but Quinn lives in Memphis. The artist still lives in Memphis. And he's going to be doing uh, some specific things around there with some of the uh, local businesses. Um, but, yeah, that's all. I'm a million miles away. That's all outside of my experience. Well, but I you told could, him I'd you Skype could, in. I told him you could, yeah. you could put me on the screen. But you know, they, they were like, no, man, we, we good. I was like, all right. Oh, uh, no, he needs to... I, I'll, I'll reach out to him. He needs he he needs to bring he needs to. Br- There's so much stuff going on. Like like last night, I was actually doing a virtual panel for um, the Afro American Museum in Colum- in um, Wilberforce, Ohio. Well, I will and- say okay. I, I I can reveal this now because this was actually just announced. Black Speculative Arts Movement is going to be doing a three hour special with Project Wildfire, the entire team, uh, on the Sunday after the book comes out. So I think it's eleven twenty nine. Um, and it's going to be a big virtual convention. So we're going to be doing that. But that's technically an L.A.-based thing. But, you know, right. because on the Internet, it's worldwide. So, you know, we're doing a thing. But, yeah, it's right. kind of in L.A. for me. Right. <laughs> Can you, they should be able to do something with some, bring you in virtually for some, with some of the um, Memphis institutions. Because be if, if you got a comic, if you got a comic set in a, set in a city that's got its own feel, you've you got you to gotta play with that. Yeah, and I I do. I definitely do. (laughs) But enough about me. Is there any more comic books this week that we want to discuss with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo? Hey, that's a segue. (laughs) Well, you know, not. No, we don't. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. This will be up on YouTube as soon as I can get my act together and get it edited in iMovie and post it up there. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Please join us on clubhouse using the it's complicated club click the greenhouse above my head and uh, be alerted to all of our rooms and when they're happening uh stanford now will be back next week in theory if life doesn't punch us in the face and uh yeah yeah this has been music that you've been listening to by archatron and cl the soul prophet and paragon and we will see you next week thank you so much see you next week <laughs>